it got also a YouTube channel. Um, and since we moved uh, to our events online, we record them and we post them on, on YouTube. So you can always uh, view them a, a, a little bit later. There's always a delay between one to two months. So the January is still not posted there, but it's going to be, it's going to be there soon. I'm going to also post uh, the link to that YouTube channel as well as I'm going to send email. All right, DevOps. So the promise of DevOps is uh, 200 times faster deployments, according to State of DevOps report uh, from a Labs in, in 2016. Well, pretty old, I presume that that's most probably much faster today. But the key element to, to achieve that is really the automation and specifically CI CD pipelines. And this is a main topic of today's session. Now, in the second part of, of this meeting, um, we'll be, we will try to experiment. We are all about learning and learning from each other. All of us coming from different backgrounds, from different organizations, uh, and with different experiences. So the experiment is going to be online lean coffee discussion. So you will be able to submit topics. You are using Mirror for this. Uh, so you should be able to see this screen. And um, the link is going to be provided in a moment. And when you scroll down to the bottom of the screen, you should see the plus sign. And, uh, and then you can actually add your own topic. And after our guest's presentation, uh, we are going to open it for, for votes and you'll be able to vote. We, are, we can start discussing um, the most popular topics. So, uh, but I'm going to talk about this later um, in, the, in, in the evening. In the meantime, I'm going to hand over to Alison to introduce our guests. Thanks, Andre. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, as Andre said, my name is Alison Bennett, and I'm the co-organizer along with Andre of the, um, of the meetup. So if you're joining us for the first time, uh, thanks for joining us. And um, we, we're going to have a great evening. I'd like to, um, to introduce, before we hand over to our, to our speaker this evening, um, Brendan O'Leary, I'd like to introduce Addie Wolf. And Addie is um, from GitLab also, and she is the strategic account leader. And she's going to um, tell us a little bit about the company and also then hand over to, um, to Brendan. So over to you, Addie. Thank you. Um, Brendan, did you want to open up the, share the presentation? Um, okay. So yeah, my name is Adi Wolf. I actually live in Canada. I live in Whistler, BC, and I work for GitLab and I cover Western Canada. We're very happy to be with everyone here today. Uh, so a little bit about GitLab. Um, I think it's the next slide, Brendan. Um, GitLab has been around since 2014 and as the newest uh, solution for DevOps, we have more than 1200 employees across, across the world and we're the largest remote company in the world and, and since COVID you can imagine a lot of organizations are coming to us to learn more about how it could be uh, a remote company and manage teams remotely. Uh, we are built on an open source model, so everyone contributes to GitLab, our community, our customers, and our 500 plus engineers uh, drive new releases, features, functionalities every single month on the 22nd uh, of every month. And this is how we are able to uh, continue to deliver rapid innovation in DevOps. And uh, one of the neat things that I learned recently is GitLab in our blog, we released uh, and recognize the folks that contribute as uh, the most valuable person of the month. Uh, so that is a little bit about us. We are a complete DevOps platform, one application with endless possibilities. Organizations rely on GitLab for source, source code management, CI, CD, security, and much more to deliver software rapidly. And Brandon O'Leary here is my colleague. He's a senior developer evangelist for GitLab. He connects with developers, contributes to open source uh, projects, uh, and shares his work about cutting edge technologies on conferences and meetups and contributed articles and blogs. And I'm going to hand it over to Brendan to show up some to uh, show us some GitLab magic. Thanks, Eddie. Really yeah. appreciate it. Uh, and thanks so much for having me, everyone. Uh, I don't live in BC. I have to be very honest about that to begin with. Um, I <laughs> am on the east coast of the United States coming to you from uh, a little town called Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, it's just east of Washington, D.C. in the States. So, uh, But we did discover before the meetup that my last trip prior to the pandemic 
uh, was actually to Vancouver and your beautiful city uh, there. So uh, I appreciate that. It, it, it's, that. That's what's in my memory of, of the beautiful days where we could travel and see people um, uh, all across the world. So really happy to be here today uh, and, and talk to you a little bit about um, how GitLab kind of sees what Andre was talking about earlier, uh, this kind of world of CI, CD, and, and how does that fit into the DevOps lifecycle? Why is that really important? Um, and as Adi mentioned, you know, GitLab is a complete DevOps platform uh, that we deliver as a single application. So we'll see a lot of that tonight. Um, <clears throat> but before we get there, I uh, just want to talk a little bit about kind of my story and how I got to GitLab um, and kind of what GitLab is and and also why GitLab is, um, because I think those will help us kind of put into the context, um, you know, what CICD uh, is and how GitLab came to, to have the vision that we have for it. Brendan, um, I'm going to interrupt you one second. Go ahead. Yeah. And I'm just going to share, I forgot that we are going to do some swag giveaways. So at the end of Brendan's presentation, I will post three questions in the chat uh, and my email address, and you can answer those questions uh, by sending me an email. And if you win, I will send you a swag code. That's it. Sorry about that. No, no, that's good. That's a good reminder. Um, so there's actually a, a, another benefit to listening to me today. And I will also say um, that if you have questions while we go through it, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I would love to take your questions in the chat and I'll actually try to reserve some time at the end. Um, uh, that could be kind of tough. I like talking a lot, but um, you know, the thing I miss most about meeting up in person is being able to kind of interact with everyone uh, directly. So feel free to to jump in if you if you have questions kind of as we go. Looks like there's also some in the chat, Brendan. So awesome, great. Well, like if you want to, if the, if they're relevant to what we're talking about, you want to verbalize them to me. Um, that that'd be fine too. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, it's hard for me to, to track the chat, but if anybody wants to like wave me down. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should um, encourage uh, people to pipe up and ask. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear from folks. Um, uh, if, if you can't though, and, and put it in the chat, that's fine. Um, okay. So one of the things I want to talk about kind of uh, is two, two things that Addy kind of touched on a little bit, um, but I think are important to, to understand about um, GitLab. Um, one is our values. Like GitLab uh, is a company that has these values. And I think, well, I know talks about those values more than any other company I've been at before it. Um, um, and we, we focus on the, these values of, um, they spell credit. And so mm -hmm. it's collaboration results, efficiency, uh, diversity, actually diversity, inclusion and belonging, iteration and transparency. Um, and I always say we, we talk more about those more. Um, if you look up our, our values page, like if you just um, Google GitLab values, you'll find it. Um, you'll see there's lots of what we call sub values, things that define what we really mean by these words. Um, they're not things we just put on a wall. Um, but, you know, these values coupled with the fact that, again, we've been all remote, as Addy said, since the start of the company in 2014 um, is really has what made us success and, and, and able to scale really well. And really excited about, you know, having, you know, these 1300 folks, um, you know, in 65 different countries and regions. It's something that I'm really proud of. Uh, I get to meet people from all over. Um, like I said, before the pandemic, got to fly and meet people all over. Um, but it's, it's still really exciting to be able to meet and interact with folks from all over. Um, but, but the other question about besides what is GitLab is why is GitLab, right? Uh, and here, I think it's a little story about um, the job that I had before GitLab. So before GitLab, I worked for a U.S. federal government contractor. Uh, like I said, I live within, uh, you know, driving distance of Washington, D.C. Basically, everyone out there <laughs> either is or has been a U.S. federal contractor at some point. And it was a smaller team, uh, and they had a few, few sizable projects, but it never really had someone to look at, like, DevOps overall for them, right? And so because of that, um, they, they brought me in to say, hey, we're going to try and understand how our different teams are doing DevOps. How can we have like a united vision? The customer, right? The U.S., the federal government was begging for that. But the first day I walked in the door, I got handed this 11-page uh, Word document, 
single spaced <laughs> line by line that was, this is how we deploy the solution. You know, every jar file and where you had to copy it and in what order um, to which server when, because somehow the order mattered. I don't, I still don't understand how the order mattered. Um, but that's what I was given. And this was a critical uh, piece of software for a critical group. It was actually for the United States Special Operations Command. Um, and yet here we were with this, this massive Word document as the way we deploy the app. Um, and that, that kind of was like a light bulb moment for me about you know, how valuable DevOps was and how much work I had to do, right? I had spent years before that in healthcare software, um, managing engineering teams um, and, and kind of learning that, but man, was that a lesson uh, when I was handed that. Um, and, it's, and it's really a critical time for all of us because um, you, know, you may have heard the term like uh, software is eating the world, right? Mark Andreessen, the famous venture capitalist said that, but he actually said that 10 years ago. <laughs> Um, and so I think by now, software has eaten the world, right? Um, and again, in the pandemic, we see, um, we see uh, the, you know, software and the way that companies interact with uh, people virtually and through their, through their apps, through software being even more critical. And more recently, Mark Andreessen was also quoted as saying cycle time compression, that is the time from writing code to getting into production, um, is the most underestimated force in determining the winners and losers in tech. And those winners and losers in tech are gonna be the winners and losers in their industry. Um, and so you wanna be able to iterate really quickly and move towards what the optimal solution is rather than taking these massive steps and ending up not at the right place. But what has happened over that time, that 10 years since Mark Andreessen said that at first, is this huge explosion of tools, right? And there's, there's lots of great tools, right? We're developers, I'm a developer, you know, like I. When I want something to work a different way, I'm going to write a tool or write something to fix it, right? Um, but the problem is that those tools don't optimize for cycle time compression. They optimize for their small little part of the cycle and doing that really well. And cycle time gets destroyed by the time that we spend integrating these things together, opening tickets for another team to do it, looking at another system for, you know, what information is there, right? That kind of, that crushes our cycle time and doesn't get us to the solution we want. And so that's where GitLab kind of came. And of course we started as a source code management system, right? And, but today we're talking about GitLab CI CD. Well, that's because as we evolved and had enterprise customers, we saw that this, you know, inefficient tool chain existed. And we started to think of it as a DevOps platform, right? Uh, and we're starting to see that through industry too. We're seeing more and more folks in industry, uh, we're seeing consolidation, um, and we've seen, you know, lots of enterprises have teams spend undifferentiated time building their own DevOps platform within their enterprise, right? And then you're doing that all over. Um, and so GitLab really is a single tool that allows you to do a lot of that, right? We have planning capabilities. We have, of course, source control management capabilities. Um, Git, right? It's right there in the name. Uh, we have CICD that we're going to dive deep on next. Um, but then we also have security built in and monitoring and deployment um, uh, monitoring. And so we're not going to spend a lot of time on all those other areas today, but I wanted to kind of frame uh, where we are before we, we dive into GitLab CI CD, which spoiler alert is one of my favorite parts. So <laughs> that's why I'm tr trying to take the time now before I um, go into it. Any, any questions up until this point? Um, thoughts on, on any of that. Great. Thanks. And for those that may have been a little early, um, I had this preface already in my presentation that, you know, this, this is going to contain our slash my opinionated view of the world, right? We talked a little bit about Git flow and we had a whole uh, discussion beforehand. Um, but we take a very opinionated look at what, what we think good looks like. Um, and this is something we call GitLab flow. Uh, and it's a process we recommend for DevOps teams because we, we think that it is the way to, again, optimize for cycle time. Um, and so the way that we look at it is, you know, the, it, there should be one canonical branch, right? The main branch that we're all working off of. Um, everything should start with an issue. What is the thing that we're going to change? Um, from there, I'm going to create the merge request in the branch at the same time, probably. 
Um, now we call it a merge request. You'll hear pull request, of course, from GitHub and others. Um, you're requesting that the system run the command git merge, but you know we can have that the argument later. But you know, I, anyway, we call it a merge request. Um, and you're committing your changes as you're working on that code. Uh, and as you do, the CI pipeline is going to run, right? We're going to run this continuous integration to make sure um, that it's going to work once it's integrated. Uh, and then that merge request should really be the sender of review and discussion, right? That's where we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about the change uh, from an engineering perspective. We're going to talk about the change from a security perspective. Uh, we're going to hopefully have like a review app so we can see the change visually and interact with the change if it's a UX change um, and, and discuss the change from a product perspective. Uh, and then we're going to have that approval point happen at the same time in the merge request. Um, and then once that is merged into the main branch, we're going to close the issue automatically. We're going to deploy it in production uh, and monitor the app out in production. Uh, so again, this is this is kind of an opinionated view of like, this is how it should go. Now, of course, there's lots of, well, but if you have little requirements, uh, but generally uh, thinking about the flow this way, I think, I think really helps. Um, and it definitely helps once we dive into the code. Um, and so that's plenty of, um, I still have a, I still have more slides, but the slides are going to have code on them, so they're getting better. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so any any questions about any of that? And I do see the one uh, question in the chat. Um, yes, we are going to share the slides. Um, um, we'll make those available for sure. Awesome, great, great, great. All right. So let's, um, we're, the majority of the time we're going to spend together here, um, you know, over the next 30 minutes or so, um, maybe a little more, is talking through the ins and outs of GitLab CI CD and, and how we've, we've implemented that. Uh, and so the first thing um, to think about is, you know, what is the anatomy of a GitLab CI CD pipeline? Um, you know, terms can be easily overloaded. So I wanted to define that kind of upfront. Um, first pipeline, what's a pipeline? So this is the set of jobs that we're going to run uh, whenever our code's committed and we're going to run the integrations and run the build and maybe run the deployment if, if that's what's happening. Um, and those can be organized into stages, which are collections of jobs. And typically, um, although we'll see there's exceptions to every rule, of course, but typically stages run um, in the jobs within the stage run parallel and stages run concurrent. So I might have a build job that runs a couple of build, uh, or sorry, build stage that may run a couple of jobs to build the application uh, and then have a test and a review and a publish or deploy stage um, that have you know one to many jobs in each of them. And when I say jobs, uh, you know, I'm talking about the scripts that perform the tasks, right? These are the things that you would do to, to build it and deploy it from your computer if you were doing it, right? We're gonna run NPM test, right? If we're, we're building a node app or run a Maven install or you know, run MS build, right? We're gonna do those things that we would normally do to compile and build and get the code ready to deploy. Uh, and then we also have this kinds of environments, right? Where are we deploying? Are there, multiple environments, a test environment, maybe a staging environment. Um, again, we may spin up a new review environment. We'll see that um, for each, uh, each deployment, or sorry, each merge request. Um, and then of course, prod where we're deploying. And um, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, we're gonna store that and the definition of all that in source control, right? And so we have a file called gitlab.gitlabci dot gitlab dash ci dot yaml that uh, stores all of this configuration and so what does that kind of look like well you know we wanted to have this kind of familiar syntax right where we're used to again scripting things um, as developers so we want to say if you can write a bash script um, you can write a ci cd pipeline right so here we see there's a you know a, a bash script called build and deploy that's running Maven clean test and package and deploy. And, you know, we can easily turn that <clears throat> into 
a, a CI file. And that could be actually just running that sh shell script, right? So the first section we see, oh, you know what? I'm going to just run that shell script. Um, or we can, you know, break that kind of continuous, like all those things that we're doing, right? Those are really different things, right? Running Maven test and Maven deploy are, are two different things. So we can break those uh, into their own jobs. And it, this is, you know, a lot of code on the screen. We're going to actually go through it one by one, but that's the basic idea. And so just to take another like bird's eye view at that anatomy, um, you know, we have this concept of a the CI pipeline, and you might say also a CD pipeline. Again, overloading terms a little bit, but you know, in the CI pipeline, you're going to do build and run your unit tests and your integration tests. Make sure the code's valid, right? Um, probably run at that point also um, static code analysis and other static security analysis, like dependency analysis that we can do. Um, and that's all built right into GitLab. Uh, then on the CD, right, like we want to have a live uh, review um, uh, review application, right? So uh, we can talk a little bit about that, but GitLab by default has this ability to deploy a review application uh, so that you can see, again, the change before merging it uh, and then deploying, of course, right? That's the, the thing we really want to do is get the code out into production. And so again, here's a, a little example um, script. Uh, again, we're going to go and, and break it kind of down one by one. But here we see three. I'll start um, looking at the whole thing, and then we'll we'll go step by step. Um, so this is a test staging and production job uh, defined in the YAML file, and uh, the stage is deploy for staging and production. Um, and then the script elements underneath it, right, are these things like app get, bundle install. Um, and then we might be doing that only when we're on the canonical or master branch um, or only when we're tagging a release, right? And so that's how we see, see here for um, staging a master. But again, we're gonna go through kind of each of, um, each of these uh, keywords and, and what makes up the YAML file next. Um, but once that YAML file is created, you get to also visualize it uh, visually. And, and one thing that this presentation isn't updated with is just in GitLab 13.9, we actually have a visual editor as well. Um, but uh, that's, that's uh, different. Um, but here we can see the visualization of the output of the job, right? And we, here we can see the stages, three stages, build, test, and deploy. Uh, and then those jobs can run independently, maybe on a different machine. Um, and then typically all jobs in that stage have to complete successfully before moving on to the next stage. Again, lots of exceptions to the rule I just stated, but we'll get to those. So let's break down kind of this GitLab CI YAML. So by default, um, and this is one of the biggest um, things that will, oh, Mark, great question. So Mark, sorry, I am I am kind of seeing the chat. Again, feel free to unmute and just say, hey, you, Brendan. Um, Mark asks, can I do a deep dive into what runners are do? Yes, I do have actually an even deeper dive at the end of the presentation about a runner, about runners, if we have time to get to it. Um, if not, again, the presentation will make available. Um, but just generally runners are, right? We talked about pipeline, jobs, stages, jobs being the scripts that run. The runner is an agent that runs that script. Um, and so there's lots of options around that that we could talk about. It could be just your laptop. More often than not, it's going to be uh, dockerized in some way. Uh, and this is where the power of GitLab CI comes into being. For instance, if you just spun up on GitLab.com a project, we're going to give you free CI minutes to use our infrastructure to run your jobs. And that's just gonna be inside of a Docker container. Now there's lots of other things you can do with runners. You can you can do um, virtual machines, you can have it be in Kubernetes. You can have, there's lots of other ways you can deploy the runner. If we have time, we'll get to that uh, in deeper, um, Mark. Uh, and if not, we can talk about it um, later. But like I said, by default, we're gonna probably be building inside of a Docker image. And this is, this is actually a really critical and powerful part of GitLab CI CD. Um, I like to just claim it as like, wow, look how smart GitLab is. 
I think it's actually really a product of when GitLab CI CD was developed, right? Um, it's when Docker had kind of won the day and we were starting to see this huge benefit. Um, but the beauty of a Docker image being, you know, by default, again, specialized cases um, aside, where you build your code is this ability to control what's inside the Docker image um, for, you know, what, what are the resources that I need? Um, going back to that, that, um, that uh, government contracting job, um, you know, I, I had a, uh, a Jenkins instance there, um, which <laughs> I had inherited. And uh, if anyone's ever run that, they know, and this is maybe outdated, but um, you have to kind of specify the name of a tool, which are, you know, the different things you can use to build. And someone had specified the name JDK um, for the Java development kit uh, and the version, but it was actually the JRE, which isn't always a problem. Uh, I don't know if I have any Java developers in the house. Sometimes it is, and when it is, it's kind of a pain. Uh, I had to actually end up like shawing the binary to figure out, oh, wait, someone had named this wrong. Um, and that was not fun. What's more fun is giving your developers the ability to just say, start from this image, right? Start from Ruby 2.3, start from JDK 1.7, uh, or start from this image that I built myself um, that has everything in it that I know um, is what's required to run my build. Uh, and then you also have the ability because of uh, Docker to have um, services that go alongside it. So um, a service is something like a Postgres or, or those kind of diff different kinds of things that you can pull in um, alongside. And again, by default, we're just going to pull those from Docker Hub and run them um, as a sidecar to your container um, so that if you need Postgres in order to run integration tests, well, you have it there. Next, there's a concept of a before and after script. So if I have something that I want to run, oops, sorry, I'm just looking at the questions here. Do, 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 is the runtime? Yes. You can run the GitLab runner anywhere um, is the beauty of it. It's actually written in Go. And so it runs on anything that can run Go, which is almost everything, close to everything. I mean, we even have a GitLab runner that runs on Linux for ZOS, right? Um, so it runs a lot of places. <laughs> um, and and yes, you can then specify the image that's used. So in that image call out in the YAML, that would be you specifying the image to start from. You can also specify when you're creating a runner, the default image. So if someone doesn't specify an image, it gets this image by default. It's not always really helpful. Like it, on gitlab.com, the default image is some Ruby image. Well, it doesn't help if you want to build node, um, but you just say image node. 14 and, and you go from there. Then uh, this concept of before and after scripts are things that, you know, can update um, your image before uh, you get started. So if you're pulling an image down from Docker Hub and you want to make sure it's up to date every time, uh, you can do that. And so they will run before every job or after every job. Um, and so that's really useful if you have these kind of setup things that you want to run multiple times um, before a job. It's also a concept of cache. Um, could spend a lot of time on this, but basically the idea is cache is something that's persistent across the life cycle of a pipeline. So things like, um, you know, maybe my, I'm a node developer for the most part. So like my node modules, right? I want to pull those once. I don't want to pull them every time. I'm just going to pass them along in the cache, um, but really could be anything. Um, are there limitations with the runners if you want the runner to be as close to prod as possible? So no. So uh, we'll talk about in a little bit, there's a tag concept where you can actually specify which runner to run something on. Uh, and the beauty of that is the runner then can then live even in a different network, uh, perhaps than GitLab. And GitLab doesn't have context or a connection to that runner. The runner connects out. Um, so like, for instance, I have runners in my house that are connected to gitlab.com, but I don't have any holes in my firewall for GitLab to come into my network. I just have my runner sitting, right, hitting, hitting gitlab.com and asking if there's any jobs for it. Um, of course, that's just my house. You can imagine, you know, if you have multiple VP, uh, VPCs, 
um, you know, those kinds of things you can, you can enforce a lot of, um, uh, you know, kind of stickiness to make sure that those, those are job. You can cu customize your home runners, host them anywhere. Um, you can have them be persistent. You can have them be auto scaling um, through Kubernetes or through a number of other methods. Um, so yes. Uh, so, um, and again, I'll, I'll talk about the runners in more detail later. So then again, now we have this concept. So we've talked about some of the like special things, um, but you know, more basic is the stages and jobs. So by default, um, GitLab assumes there's going to be a build test deploy stage. Um, but most folks, you know, end up specifying their specific stages for what they want. Um, so we've got the image defined. We've got maybe some scripts that we need to run before and after. And now we're going to say, okay, these are the stages that we want to run. Um, and all of the jobs are going to run in one of these stages. And so that job definition is going to have, you know, the stage that it's defined as, um, as running inside of. And then it's also going to have the script. And so that script can be, um, you know, like a, a single line command. It can be multiple lines with, uh, a, you know, a, an entry for each line, or it could be a path to like, you know, a batch script or a, a shell script that's going to run uh, and I store it in the side of the repo, right? So if I have a build that I want the developer to do and I want it to happen the same way on CI, I could have just a script that runs. Um, and, then, and then that's the same way each time. Uh, and the job has a lot of options in it. So next we're gonna kind of go through some of those job, uh, job options. One is environments. So um, I mentioned a little bit about earlier about how there's, you know, you can say this job, it, this is an optional part where I can say this job is going to create a deployment to this environment, right? Um, and so that lets me, you know, here say that this job is gonna deploy to an environment named prod and the URL of that is gonna be this. And here we see um, some, some uh, uh, environmental variables that GitLab has for me um, that I'm using to calculate what the domain um, or what the URL will be. Um, and so that's another really powerful part of GitLab CI is environmental variables. We won't get into that today, but um, if you're using GitLab CI today, that's maybe the next thing to look at is all of the built-in environmental variables that GitLab gives to you. And then I'm saying when uh, manual. So when has a couple of different options. Um, you know, by default, kind of, you can think um, it is, um, you know, when on success is an option. And that's kind of there by default, right? We're, we're going to run this job if the stuff before me was successful. Um, but I can also have a job that specifies on failure. So I can say only run this job if there's been a failure in the pipeline, right? So if there's some sort of notification I want or cleanup that I need to do in that case, um, I can say on failure. Um, or I can say always. So, hey, this job is going to execute if there's a success or a failure, no matter what, run this job. Um, and then lastly, I can say when manual. And so this is going to actually have a need a human being to press a button, a little play button on the job to say, yes, we're ready to deploy this to prod. Um, go ahead and do it. Uh, and I think the next slide actually talks about those manual triggers. Yep. Oh, <laughs> I, I went ahead of myself. But yeah, so that when manual allows you to trigger those jobs um, manually. Any questions about jobs or stages so far? And I'm just going to go to the chat as well. Doo, doo, doo. Yeah, uh, someone says, uh, is, a, is feature, are feature flags available in GitLab? So yes, we have um, a feature where you can set up feature flags um, with GitLab. Um, not included in this presentation, but A, you can Google GitLab feature flags. You'll find it real quick. Um, B, it's based on, um, I think it's Unleash. Yeah, it's an open source library called Unleash um, for feature flags that we use. And we basically host the server version of Unleash that your app can hit and get um, the status or details of a feature flag from. Next question, will manual fail the pipeline if it's already passed and the manual job fails? I think yes. <laughs> That's a great question. I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. If a manual job runs and fails, the pipeline will then show as failed. I'm, I'm fairly certain that answer to that question is yes. Great. All right, so 
that's the basics. That's why I asked for questions here because I did basics. I'm going to go into some more advanced stuff uh, here, but I, I had this kind of simplistic world that I just built for you where, you know, if stage succeeds, we go to the next stage and I just run it if it's successful or failure. But we all know that, you know, <laughs> thing, life is more complicated than that, unfortunately. But luckily, GitLab has an answer for that. Um, and that's this concept of rules. Uh, again, some folks um, I, I see have used GitLab before, and that's awesome. Um, you'll see this says new, and it has a slash through these words, only and accept. Um, for folks that haven't, there's kind of an, an older version of this called only and accept that was a little um, limited. And But now there's a very powerful rules engine built into GitLab um, where I can you know specify very discreetly what are the conditions under which this job needs to run? Um, and it allows me to create a much more um, dynamic pipeline. Um, and then I actually can also cr create, and I think I talk about this later, a directed acyclic graph of my pipeline where things are not just dependent on stage and jobs uh, based off of these things. Um, so in, the, in this case, only if this pipeline source is web will this job um, run. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a, just a kind of a quick reference here. Um, you know, this, this concept of if um, is, is kind of obvious, right? Like if something's true or false, um, then, you, um, then you can run the job. Um, and again, I can say if, and then pair that with those when clauses we talked about earlier to say, you know, if this is true, <coughs> then don't run this or do run this or run this on success, et cetera. And then the other uh, clauses here are changes and exists. So changes is really powerful because I can, with this, I can say only if this file or this set of files or this files within this folder, <coughs> excuse me, only if those have changed, does this job need to run? So you can think like um, if it's, you know, uh, maybe a monorepo where there's two distinct services and two folders, right? I might say the stuff for this only needs to run and rebuild itself if something's changed in there. Um, or, you know, <clears throat> if a certain file's changed, um, there's different things we need to do or different alerts we need to run. Uh, and that's what allows it for that. And then exists is similar to say, if a certain file or folder exists in the repo, then we need to run this. Otherwise, um, we don't. Uh, and again, if nothing's, um, nothing's defined there, it's going to by default say, I'm going to run this when stuff ahead of me is successful. Uh, and I'm not going to allow you to fail, right? Because I'm going to break the pipeline. I'm going to fail the pipeline if this job fails. Um, but I can change those if I want. Um, and so this has kind of, it's added to the pipeline if I, if the, I hit a rule that matches and it's on success or always. And if a rule doesn't match and the last clause is on success um, with no rule, then I, then I will. Uh, and it's not kind of on the, uh, added to the pipeline of the inverse of that, right? I don't get a match as I go through all the rules. Um, there's no standalone uh, clause telling me to, or if I match a rule and it says when never, right? That's how I decide whether I'm gonna include that job in the pipeline or not. And I think it's easier to understand with a couple examples. Um, so like here we say, we're gonna run this job if the pipeline came from a merge request, right? Someone created a merge request and that's why this pipeline's running. Or, and if we, so if we hit that, we're gonna run it. Um, or if we hit it and the pipeline source was a scheduled job, scheduled job, so you can have scheduled pipelines that run on the schedule, um, then I'll run this. A slightly more complex example would say, um, so if I come down and it's a merge request event, we'll see it says when never. So if this is a merge request event and that matches, automatically we know we're not gonna run it. Um, and then if it's source schedule, we're not gonna run it. And then all other times we're going to run it if the, if the pipeline's been successful so far. So it's kind of the inverse of what we just saw, um, where if it's a merge request event or schedule, don't run this job. I can also define custom variables, right? So those are variables that GitLab defines for me, this like pipeline source, again, a huge set of um, variables there. Um, but I can also have custom variables that I use. 
um, and I can match them to a string value exactly and say that it has to have changes to a certain file. And we're only going to run it manually, right? Um, so we can combine a lot of these things into, into more complex um, uh, more complex elements. Uh, and I can also delay jobs, right? So I can say if this is the, the master branch, um, three hours from now, run this job. Uh, and so that's kind of the idea of rules. Um, again, you can get really advanced. I'm going to show you some, some um, pipelines after the next section, and we'll go from that. Any other questions there? Awesome. Great, great, great. Thanks for handling the ones about the video, Andre. Um, so again, this allows us to do some of these more um, advanced pipeline uh, architectures, right? So I can allow certain jobs to fail, right? So here test B is allowed to fail. Um, so it gives me a warning on the pipeline, but allows it to continue. Um, and then here the deploy job has one manual, right? So it waits for someone to click that play button. But I can also have a dis directed acyclic graph and something get people up to say that because that's what Git is, right? Um, and this is the idea where, you know, previously I mentioned everything in the stage has to pass and finish and then the next stage will run. Well, we actually can be a little bit more specific by, than that by saying, what specifically does this job need ahead of it to start running? And so here we can see, you know, you can imagine a simple scenario where we're building for Android and iOS. Um, you know, the Android tests don't have to wait for the iOS build to run <clears throat> in order for them to start running. They only have to wait for the Android build to run. Um, and this can make for some confusing lines, which get somewhat better uh, with a new feature um, called DAG visual visualization, where I can see exactly um, how the pipeline is going to move, um, what depends on what, uh, and how each of those go. Now that's all within a, sim a single project typically. And again, it could be a, um, uh, a mono repo that has more than one service in it, but sometimes you have services or projects that involve more than one physical repo. And so in that case, you can actually also have an architecture where you have parent and child pipelines. So I might have a parent pipeline that kicks off a downstream pipeline, right? This, this ha is a dependency of the next thing down from me and I'm gonna run these other pipelines after this one's completed. Um, and again, that can allow you to have um, either microservices or monorepo architecture here. In, uh, in a monorepo scenario, we might say, you know, we're including um, the pipeline from another project within the same repo. Uh, or I can have it be multiple projects where I'm saying, at the end of this job, trigger a downstage um, project to run. Um, okay, here's a question. Does multi pipeline? Oh, there's a couple questions here. Let me just get to those real quick. Best way to store and centralize GitLab secrets for multiple repos. With secrets in them. Da, 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 da. Yeah, so there's a concept of GitLab uh, CI variables that you can store. Um, they used to be called GitLab secrets. Um, they're not anymore because if they're really secret, we recommend maybe a, a secret store like a, a HashiCorp vault or a secret store from your um, uh, in, environment. Um, so we have an integration with HashiCorp vault for real secrets. If we're talking about like secrets in a production environment that you're gonna deploy to AWS with, um, you're gonna use our vault integration, which I don't cover at all in this, um, but you can look that up. Um, for GitLab variables, right, the variables um, that you can have in the pipeline, those custom variables, uh, there is a way to organize them better um, because you can have them be at the group level. Um, and so instead of putting those variables in each project, uh, you can put them at the group and then all the projects in that group will um, uh, inherit them. But yeah, we actually intentionally, <laughs> so I, I didn't talk about my history at GitLab. I'm, I'm now a developer evangelist. I was for a time, and I think I, I hinted at it, I actually ran our, our CI product for a time as product manager uh, and, and changed the word secrets intentionally because um, while they're encrypted in the database and everything, you know, it's not a true secret store like a, like a HashiCorp vault. Um, so 
And then there's another question about um, multi-project pipelines uh, superseding using a token. It's similar. It's actually <laughs> on the back end. It's this, again product manager knowledge. The back end. It's a very similar mechanism. Um, so uh, you bring up a point that you can trigger a pipeline um, with a token through our API. Um, GitLab is basically doing that under the covers in this uh, case where we see uh, the word trigger um, uh, here. Okay, great. So I want to look at a couple of pipelines now. I have a lot more slides that I can go through. I've got uh, slides about the runner, um, but we've got just a few minutes left in, in my allotted time. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going to be around for questions and, and I can jump around after this, but I want to just take a look at a couple of like real world pipelines because as great as these slides are, I think looking at them will, will get um, even more uh, questions and, and ideas flowing. Um, so the first one I like to show off is the, the app that brought me to GitLab as a user. So before I worked for GitLab, uh, I had, I, I became a GitLab user because I, with a buddy of mine, wrote a side project. I know nobody's ever done this. <laughs> and it's an app for Slack. Um, it's just a simple little to-do list basically for Slack. Um, and it got very popular. It has thousands and thousands of users and um, tens of people that pay me for it because you know most people don't pay for Slack. So they don't want to pay for your app, which is like a super succinct st statement that if I ever try to run, raise venture capital for the for I'll pretend like I don't know, but <laughs> I do know now. Um, and so I had this app that wasn't really making any money, kind of paying for the servers maybe ish. <laughs> um, and I was paying for, uh, for uh, hosting the repo on GitHub. And I didn't want to do that. And at the time, GitLab had free repositories. Now everybody does, GitHub does as well. Um, and so I ended up bringing the repository over here. Uh, and then the other problem I had was, again, thousands of users, plenty of users, not so much on the revenue side, um, which means I had problems. I had to, you know, I had stuff I needed to fix. Um, and so I wouldn't always have my laptop, right? I might be at work. And so that's when I realized that, oh, GitLab has the CI CD thing. And not only that, I can edit it right in here uh, and GitLab will go and deploy my app for me into Heroku. And that's great. Um, so here, let's just take a look at my, my pipeline here um, and we'll go through some of the concepts we talked about. Um, so again, we have our stages set up, test, deploy and post test. Um, so it's a node app. And so you can see uh, here, I'm specifying which version of node I want to use. Um, I'm in this case, just running NPM install to gather up my node modules and put them into cache, right? So that way I have the node modules for every job from then forward. Uh, and then in my tests, I'm just running NPM test, right? And I'm pulling out an artifact. So it's something we didn't talk about, but uh, an artifact that is this report. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, a report that comes out of my test. So I have that. Um, and I even let myself skip those unit tests if I put the right commit message in. As you can see here, I say accept when the commit message has that in it. Um, and then I run a num number of other jobs. Uh, and in the end, I deploy to production. So I deploy to Heroku um, using this uh, this little gem. Uh, and I have this Heroku production API key that's that's in my variables that allows me to run that, that command. Uh, and then actually after I deploy, I even I run some uh, API integration tests as well. And so if we look at that pipeline, we can see, and actually I just noticed with you live that I had something failed last time. <laughs> um, we can see all of those uh, same steps we saw before. And if I drill into one of them, we can see the output of that job ex uh, exactly as it happens. So here we can see we're running on a, a GitLab runner uh, from Docker Autoscale. So this is the pool of runners that gitlab.com has for me. Um, I'm pulling that Docker image that I specified in my file. Um, I'm running any pre, uh, um, pre scripts I have, uh, and then I'm running my npm install, right, and and caching that up. So so there I have all of the different um, things that are that are happening in each job. And so that's a very simplistic pipeline, right? Um, but something 
I'm going to jump to even more complex and then I'm going to go back in the middle. So of course, the other thing we do with GitLab is we build GitLab. So if we look at the GitLab org slash GitLab project, this is the source code for all of GitLab, um, both the open source version and all the proprietary code is uh, source available here. Um, and if we look at these pi this pipeline, we'll see a much uh, more advanced <laughs> and, and complex pipeline than, than we saw uh, in mine. And actually we'll see um, lots of stages. And then we'll also see um, setting some variables. And then we see this concept of includes. So here GitLab is actually pulling in jobs from various other um, parts of the repository to build um, what essentially is a monorepo um, in GitLab. So I'm actually gonna open this in our web IDE um, so that we can look at some more of those files. And it's going to load up for me. So here we can see I'm including this GitLab CI build images and docs and front end. So if I go GitLab CI docs, we'll see the CI file that builds all of our documentation, right? Our documentation is included in our code and it gets built with it. And so then in the pipeline, I go back to the project. We'll see that we end up with a, a much more complex um, pipeline. And we'll actually have different pipelines depending on what parts of the application we're touching. For instance, if you're only touching the docs, you'll get a pipeline that only builds and tests and runs the tests for the docs, right? Um, so here we see some things merging into master. Um, and so those will be different than perhaps, oh, it's the end of the day, everyone's merging, right? <laughs> so I don't have anything fun. Um, but we'll see that the pipeline is much more complex. There's over 223 jobs running um, and still running um, throughout all of this. And so we're running R spec for the Ruby stuff, we're running DB checks, uh, where we're spinning up databases and checking against that. Um, we're running dependency scanning, um, we're running linting, all kinds of things that are happening. Uh, and we're standing up a review environment. So for every merge request to GitLab, we actually stand up an entire GitLab instance so that we can log on to it and see exactly how it looks. And just finally, in just a minute uh, left here, I wanna talk about uh, another thing, and that's what we call auto DevOps. And so here you'll see, this is a Spring Boot um, project, a really simple Hello World Spring Boot project, project. And you can see I don't have a GitLab CI YAML here, but I do have a pipeline that run, uh, that ran, excuse me, um, and failed. <laughs> um, and this pipeline is what's called auto DevOps. So for many languages, you can commit your code to GitLab and turn on auto DevOps and it automatically detects your code using a thing called cloud native build packs um, and knows how to build that code, right? If it's Java or if it's Node or if it's, um, you know, a certain other Ruby, I'm, I'm not sure if all the languages are supported. Uh, it'll find that, it'll build it, it'll detect if you have uh, unit tests, right? In a framework for that type of uh, code base. And then it's also gonna run code quality checks. It's gonna run um, static code analysis. Uh, secret detection, make sure you don't have secrets committed into your repo. It's going to run a thing called license scanning, which shows all of the different types of open source licenses you might have brought in with dependencies. Uh, it's going to run dependency scanning uh, to find any uh, known uh, dependency uh, CVs for any of the depend open source dependencies you've brought in. Uh, it's going to run container scanning to run each layer of, your, of a container if you're building a Docker container. Um, and then it can actually also Dockerize your app for you. And if you connect GitLab to a Kubernetes cluster, it can deploy that app automatically into the Kubernetes cluster. Um, and so this is a super powerful tool for like just getting started with GitLab. Uh, you know, the idea is you upload your code uh, and connect your Kubernetes cluster and you can deploy um, without writing any CI code. But uh, as my last trick um, for the, uh, you know, since I'm in a room full of engineers, that sounds too good to be true. Well, it's great, but the other great thing about it is 
in the end, what Auto DevOps is, is a really well-written CI file. And so I just went to templates, um, Auto DevOps for a GitLab CI YAML, and you'll see that it brought in all of this. Well, this is on the back end what GitLab is doing to run those jobs and then detect the language and do all those different things. So I can actually start from that or just pull out part of it, right? Maybe I just want to pull out that code quality or, or the, um, the, you know, static code analysis or browser performance testing aspects and pull those into my own um, then custom file. So great. That's um, all I really wanted to present. And I think we're, we're just at about the time I had uh, allotted. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hopefully there's some questions and I do see the chat has been going, going off <laughs> while I've been presenting. So I will take a look at that next. Yeah, lots of questions for you, Brendan. And awesome. and everyone, everyone, you can feel free to um, unmute and ask Brendan live. Um, this is this is a Q and A session, so uh, please please go for it. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think uh, Canadians are very polite, so they did they didn't want to interrupt your presentation. <laughs> but there's a lot okay. of questions. Please go ahead. Oh, and I see that Addy has just posted the questions for the swag giveaway um, in the chat. So uh, I noticed you had timestamps in your GitLab log file, the log file. Can you describe how you got that done? Uh, yeah, the, the length of time um, stamps, you mean? On the right-hand side? That's correct. Yeah, so that is automatic as of a certain GitLab version. Um, so that's a relatively new feature. I'm not sure what version of GitLab that came in, uh, but if you're running a self-managed GitLab instance and you're behind um, in version, uh, you may not see that yet. Okay. Thanks. But on GitLab.com, you should see it. And then if you update, I, I'm pretty sure that that is just part of GitLab um, and you might just need to update. Okay. I'm just going to Google it as well. Uh, job time stamps. Oh, hey, Brendan. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, I was curious about, you know, you guys are spinning up all these runners. That's got to be some significant resources on your end for the hosted stuff. So mm -hmm. is there like a status console that indicates, um, any issues and has there historically been any issues with regards to resource exhaustion? Great, that's a great question. Um, so one is there are limits. Um, so like, I, I don't know them off the top of my head, but if you like look at our pricing page, there's a certain number of limits. Oh, sorry about that. Um, a certain number of limits um, for minutes based on like the free tier has a certain number of minutes that you get per month. Um, and then for each of our paid tiers, it's more minutes per month, as you can imagine. Um, so it's not like you can't just go spin up, a, you know, a thousand runners and run them all month long. Um, so that's one way we do it is with limits. Um, the second way is um, we're using auto scaling um, to, to um, build and run each of those. So actually each of those... Um, every job, even though it's running inside of a Docker container, um, for isolation in running a hosted service, right? Like running gitlab.com for the whole world. Um, we actually create a new virtual machine and run a, and run the job inside of a new virtual machine for every job that's run on gitlab.com. Um, so you, you won't exhaust the resources in the sense that, um, <laughs> We're running in GCP, and I don't think we'll be able to do that. Um, but we are creating a new uh, instance every time. Uh, as far as um, uptime, the uptime is very good. Again, it's it's distributed. It's you know it's a very distributed system in that way, um, and so we have the ability to scale it pretty quickly. Um, and in fact, there's also a public dashboard that I'll link in here. I'm pretty sure it's public. Let me make sure it's public before I just because you'll get no answer. 
I do think you have to be logged in to gitlab.com to see this, but you should be able to see this um, dashboard once you log into gitlab.com um, or if you're already logged in in your browser. Uh, and that actually shows how many machines and jobs were running uh, at a given time. And like the queue timing and all of that. Um, the goal is that each job is picked up within one second um, at a maximum. So just piggybacking on that, is there like something like a concept that you said you're in GCP, but you know, AWS has their spot instances. So for jobs that don't need to run in a timely manner, is there a way that you could realize some kind of savings utilizing spot instances? Yeah, a hundred percent. So there's, there's a lot of documentation um, in about running GitLab on AWS and auto scaling uh, runners in AWS. And um, a lot of folks that do that use spot instances. And so um, we've traditionally used a technology called Docker plus machine uh, to do that, which allows is, a, is actually like a Docker open source project um, that allows you to create um, machines in like mm -hmm. lots of different cloud mm -hmm. services. And so for like AWS, you can actually specify like the bidding and spot instance, all those details about spot instances. Um, and you can basically have a bastion host, you know, tiny little thing that is basically spawning these new EC2 instances, requesting spot instances, et cetera, for, uh, for jobs. And I'm going to send a docs link for that too. Cause like I said, there's a lot of details um, for that. So what about other instance types? Like somebody mentioned earlier on, like, you know, some of the more esoteric stuff like Mac OS. I know like Circle CI has Mac OS runners mm -hmm. and does GitLab support that as well? So uh, we don't have the ability for you to request a Mac runner from us yet. Um, you can have your own Mac runners, right? Like for instance, my laptop I'm sitting on right now is a runner. Um, or if you have Mac hardware or, um, something like Mac Stadium, you can bring your own Macs um, and run builds. But we're actually currently working on a partnership um, with Mac Stadium, I believe, although don't quote me on that, to bring uh, GitLab runners like within um, from GitLab uh, for Mac. And then we do have already today Windows runners uh, on GitLab.com that you can request. Um, basically by the tag is how you do that. So we didn't talk about tagging runners, um, but my presentation, when you get the link, has a lot of details on that. Um, as you can say, I tag, I want a Windows-based runner. It's more specific than that. Um, and then we're working on that for Mac OS. And I'm going to send that link along as well. So the other thing, you know, we talked about our, our values um, GitLab, again, is one of the values is transparency. So we actually build in the open, right? That GitLab-org slash GitLab thing I showed you, that's where our code is. That's where all the issues for GitLab are. Um, and uh, so I'm going to find the actual issue that's about getting um, Mac OS runners working uh, and, and share that and once I find it. You, you talked about um, supporting like a hybrid environment for lack of a better term. So like I could have on-premise, you know, if I had Mac OS hardware, I could have on-premise Mac OS runners running and I could be using hosted GitLab runners for other OSs that you do support. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And the beauty of that hardware that you own or, you know, maybe it's <laughs> cloud instance you own is we don't charge you anything for those minutes, right? Like the only, you know, I talked about minutes earlier and, and that. Like that's only for using our hardware, right? Um, you can have an infinite number of jobs running on your own hardware um, and still use gitlab.com. Awesome, thank you. I have a question about pipelines. Can you see what variables were passed into a pipeline which has finished executing? Good question. I might have to get back to you on that. I don't know. Okay. I couldn't uh, find anything visible on the, on the web UI. Yeah. I don't know if you can, of course you could print the variables out in a job log, but I'm trying to think if there's a way to see what the variables were at the time. I'm not sure. 
I'd have to get back to you on that one. Okay, thanks. I've got a question. I have a use case, which I believe is very common. I start with a special binary and I uh, have a Python Flask web server associated with it. And those go into a Docker image, which goes into uh, Knative or Google Cloud Run is my favorite Knative right now because they have scaled scale to one instead of scale to zero, which really solves the latency problem you might've heard about with uh, Knative and Cloud Run. But anyway, sure, sure. I think that this is a very common build scenario. And I'm wondering if there's like a template or a, a particular how-to blog that you that caught your eye and you thought, oh, well, that really explains it nicer. Any, uh, um, you know, docs on, you know, getting started with that kind of a uh, build path? Yeah, I know there, it, we, I think we wrote, co-authored a blog with the Google folks. Um, let me send you a couple links that I'm just finding immediately. I don't remember if these are the Please. ones I was talking about. Um, but one is from Google and one is from us. <laughs> uh, so I think I think that is the oh, really yeah. appreciate. Thank the you. one from Google is really great. It's got like all of the like API details and everything. Um, so yeah, yes. The answer is yes. We, we um, again, most of our customers are probably in AWS, right? Because AWS is a market leader. Um, and so again, lots of resources around AWS, but the beauty of us being in GCP and, and being super familiar with it is there's a lot of resources for that as well. Well, huge thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I think our blog that I sent you to is actually specifically about Anthos, which might not help. Um, but the Google one is, is, I think, exactly what you're looking for. Um, I'm just looking up in the chat here. Um, Nicholas asked about runners uh, filling up their disk with cache material. Um, is there an auto cleanup? I'd recommend you can have cache store in object storage um, instead of on the runner itself. That may help. Um, I don't know if there's automated, if you're store storing the cache on disk, I don't know if there's an automated way to clear that up. That's a good question. Um, looks like Addy answered the question about is GitLab competing with Jenkins? I, yes, I mean, we're... Um, we've been in this uh, CI CD market for some time now. Um, so that, that kind of puts us in competition with Jenkins, I suppose. Um, you know, our, our focus has again, heavily been on the enterprise and kind of this, you know, entire DevOps platform. And we think that's, that's really the future. And then Mark's question about resource adoption. We are exhaustion. We talked about that timestamps. Okay. That might have covered it. I don't know if there's any other questions. Any final questions for Brendan? I'll jump in with a final question. Okay. Uh, hey, Brendan. So what, if anything, do you guys offer with regards to training? Like if you wanna bring your team up to speed on GitLab, where would you point us? Yeah, uh, so a couple of things. Um, one, again, a lot of that is out there and available. Um, uh, the thing I would start with is, I'm just finding it here. Um, it's called GitLab Learn, um, which is kind of like a central repository of all the kind of different things that GitLab does and how to learn about them. Uh, I'm just sending that link in here. Um, and then beyond that kind of like, open uh, learning um, is we also have a services team um, that provides like formal training um, and like certification programs, um, you know, as part of like paid training. Um, so if you have a team that you want to get uh, like kind of formally trained and, and certified, you can talk with um, your uh, account manager, whoever your sales uh, person is, and they can get you in touch with uh, the right folks for that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome. I think that we're at time almost perfectly. So 
thanks so much for for having me. I think I'll stick around, but uh, great questions and really fun to uh, chat with everybody. Thank Excellent. you. Yes, thank you very much, Brandon. And and Adi, Adi also posted the questions for the swig, uh, uh, swag giveaway. So um, please email her. Oh yeah, I've been I've been responding. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, so People are answering it. already. They're on it. Oh, we've got some winners. That's for sure. I'm at it. <laughs> if there's swag involved. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay, you for, for hosting. I mean, for hosting this and for inviting us. We, we're very happy to be here. And um, I'm sure, Brandon, you know, maybe in the future, we can dive into some some deeper topics, do deeper dives. Sure, sure. Yeah. And like I said, there's there's more... Lots of details, lots of links on my slide that then go, you know, it's a slide and it goes to the documentation. So uh, you'll be able to take a look at all of that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so in such a case, we're going to move to the second part of, um, of uh, our event. And this is the open discussion, Lean Coffee. So there were several questions and the voting closed already. So um, let's have a look what we've got. Um, so questions, uh, the votes were pretty fragmented, I think. So in this moment, uh, the highest one was, is there a unit testing framework that drives building the GitLab uh, CI YAML pipeline? A lot of people tend to get frustrated by the brittleness of YAML. Um, you accidentally add one extra space and it crashes, for example. Good. Yeah. So I'll uh, talk what, um, about that real quick, if that's okay. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yes and yes and yes. Um, there is a linter um, for the GitLab YAML. That's really helpful. Um, you can uh, either do that like on the web in GitLab or most um, most IDEs have a plugin for it. Like I know that v VS Code is my IDE of choice. So I know that there's one for it. Um, where it can do um, specifically GitLab YAML linting. Uh, there's also an API endpoint to do it. Um, and, and no worries, the pipeline will tell you if you do actually end up pushing it uh, very quickly <laughs> that there's a linting error. Um, and then the other nice thing, again, is this new uh, visual editor that we didn't talk about or I didn't have in my slides because it's brand new. Um, I'll add a link into the chat uh, for that. And that's going to obviously help a lot too by not you know, you, you can just change something really quick about uh, a given job visually and not have to worry about the YAML as much. Excellent, thank you. Any any other comments? Anybody else having experience with this? Mm, I have a comment. Okay, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, so yeah, don't, don't worry about uh, JAML, JAML at, at all. Uh, most of the CI solutions are based on YAML, so yeah, don't 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 care about that. Um, it's a, GitLab is a very good tool, and let me say to you that once you use GitLab, uh, you want to stick with <laughs> with all the products of GitLab, and and yeah, it's very painful when you have to go away. So <laughs> I really can recommend GitLab. Thanks for the talk, guys. Very good. Thank you. Anybody else? Any experience sharing? Uh, I'm just going to mention, I think I'm having an issue with my swag code. So everyone who's uh, sent us the answers, uh, I will make sure I sent an updated code tomorrow. Uh, Apologize about that. Not sure why it's not working. Not my department, but we'll make sure you're happy. Okay, thank you. All right, in such a case, let's move to the next topic that we've got here. And this is the question about, well, uh, how do you define DevOps? Brendan, would you like to actually, like, you know, anybody I'm talking to, you know, we've got like uh, three people in the room, we've got four different opinions and definitions, how you would define DevOps. Sure, yeah. Uh, yes, like you said, <laughs> you get a lot of different opinions. Um, 
you know, I think when I talk about defining DevOps, I, I also like to talk a lot about before DevOps, which, you know, Andre, I think you and I probably remember, but maybe not everyone does. <laughs> right. Um, and so maybe defining it by what it isn't um, in some ways, like before DevOps, you had, you know, developer and operations, right. That the, we had these two separate words. Um, and oftentimes you'd have developers write code and maybe test it, maybe not, and throw it over a wall to the operations folks. Um, and the problem is there's this, there's this natural tension, right? Developers are motivated to ship things quickly and get features added and operators are motivated by stability, um, which used to always mean ship things slowly <laughs> and change as little as possible. Uh, and so the reason we brought those two words together was to try and say, look, we, we're all part of this kind of value chain. Um, you know, you'll see lots of chains <laughs> for DevOps. Uh, of delivering value to customers. And we need to have developers that think like operators and operators that think like developers um, and really kind of align the incentives and and align the, the missions of both groups uh, to be the same. And so that's why we created a word for it, <laughs> that alignment of incentives. Well, I, I'm a little bit uh, younger than you. So I remember actually at times when we were coding assembler still on, on, on Intel 8080. And actually we are a DevOps at the time because there was nobody else to actually do this job. So we did everything. Any other comments? How you guys define DevOps? What do you think? What is it for you? What does it mean for you? So my oh. definition is very, very close to, to Brandon. Okay, someone, someone else want to say something? Yeah, so I can remember uh, like the, the work of the sysadmin guys uh, before all this stuff uh, about DevOps. DevOps uh, and yeah, LAMP stack. So sysadmins installing all the stuff, deploying the code and testing uh, in maybe in production <laughs> because there was not that separation of environments and that, uh, uh, I mean, that uh, ability that we have right now. So yeah, DevOps is uh, like uh, Mark said, uh, shared ownership between uh, developers and operations team. Uh, so you you this uh, this is coming to improve, and not not only in the technical way but also in the culture for the corporations. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, a group of uh, culture philosophies and practices that increase the um, the ability to deliver good code do, to production. So yeah, excellent. We are aligned. Okay. Anybody else has a strong opinion? Well, I would just chime in saying that I think DevOps is really about um, being honest with what was working, what wasn't working. You know, because ultimately it becomes a hybrid. Uh, you have to take into the con you have to take into context the culture of the organization and and you know your ability to stretch people because there's a cost. You know, when you implement these things, sometimes it takes a lot longer. People have to really drink the Kool-Aid before they commit 100%. So it's a journey, right? Yeah, I, I love that. that. You know, culture is really, really, very, very important for, in DevOps. So absolutely agree. Alex, you, your hand is up. Uh, hi, thank you. You're I very just polite. To... <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to mention, and you know this, Andre, because we had uh, Dave Nicolette uh, present to us uh, last uh, fall. And when I started my career, we, we were already going into client server and whatnot. But talking to my older colleagues, they say that that's how things used to be, that you, you write a program and you run it and there is no separation. And then something happened, and I don't know what happened, that we really separated operations from development and now we're healing the divide. And mm -hmm. uh, as everybody mentioned here, we really want to you know, take full own ownership and I, I'm building and I'm running and everything end to end, you know, I, I respond to the in the middle of a night call or whatnot, but that's the life of the DevOps uh, engineer. 
Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think the reason for, for the separation at a certain point became that um, the systems and especially the structures and management within organizations um, started evolving into you know or more process orientation rather than actually getting working software. I mean, you know, getting back to the agility, right? What is really the most important? We want to protect ourselves from bugs. And because we had some bugs in the past, so let's add additional process and then add additional one. And then there, there, you need someone to manage all of that. And then, you know, suddenly, oh, there's actually a whole chasm. There's a whole gap between, you know, developers and, and, and people who operate. But, but that's true that there is, there is a, a conflicting, conflicting interests or, or forces. From one side, developers want to introduce the change because that's what they are for. And on the other hand, you've got the people who operate and they want to resist um, or have as minimal change as possible. So obviously there, there is a there's a conflict created and with DevOps, we are trying to, to close this. Yeah. And also there is a lot of accidental complexity. I'm going to say something controversial here. Um, Unix philosophy took over. And Unix philosophy is based one to one and up with a big mosaic and, and big puzzle consisting of many, many components. And when you throw them all together, you have a, a complex system with a lot of moving parts. And before you know it, accidental complexity enters. And now we are we see many defects that are not actually traceable back to the source code, actually based on this accidental complexity. And I think DevOps is really focused on trying to tame that accidental complexity because we have many, many moving parts. And, Back in the day, when I talked to my older colleagues, a monolith, a, a, a big iron mainframe, or um, a mid-range, for example, IBM AS400, was super easy to run you know, and, and easy to program for because everything was really contained. You didn't have to worry about anything, right? Compared today with microservices, Kubernetes, and orchestration, and, and choreography, and all that, it's, it's crazy. It makes your mind <laughs> boggle, right? So here we are. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And uh, James, your hand is up. Thanks. I wanted to say I do see flaws that have come from those sources, but I think another big source is cutting corners. There's a lot that is done for profit motive and schedule meeting, which really causes a huge category of flaws that have no homogeneity in their manifestation or you know the textual representation of what kind of bugs they actually are and that kind of thing. But I want to go away from the abstract and ask a real super uh, technically applied question. Um, if you have a GitLab system with continuous integration, continuous development running, and you want to add a test, but you don't know what kind of build system it uses, it just has make files, or maybe it's a Python, a new fancy Python build system, or you know maybe it's a, all, all based on the uh, GitLab uh, uh, configuration itself. If you just want to add tests, how do you approach that? Do you do you analyze uh, one configuration file before another? Do you look at the logs? What's the best way to take an existing CI/CD pipeline and add one or more tests to it? And so you're saying you're you're not sure what those tests are, or you know what the tests are, you're just not sure about the build yeah, environment? Yeah, you, you know the tests, you're going to like grep for some string in an output file at some point after running a binary that gets built. So maybe three lines, you know, run the binary, grep, and then do some kind of a Boolean something. And uh, you can make a shell script out of that. And it, But is there a, a general approach, a how-to guide, of course, is what I'm asking for again, sorry, <laughs> uh, for taking an existing pipeline and adding a patch to it? Um, sure. I mean, the, the, yeah, the beauty is, you know, it, again, it's, it's another file in the repository, right? So you're going to propose a change to it um, and you're going to add a job. And again, it doesn't matter. You could run it in the default image that is running or you could specify your own image, right? Uh, if it's something as simple as, you know, a binary and an output and a grep, then, you know, you're probably going to be able to run it no matter what the environment is. Um, and so you're going to add, you know, a, a name for the job, uh, the stage you want it to run in and script, and maybe the three lines of, you know, run this binary grep for this, um, exit the way you want. Right. Um, and you'll, and you'll go from there. 
Got it. Thank you. I also want to add some ideas uh, for that one. Uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. So it's always depend on what is uh, like the best, uh, the way that you learn things, new things. Uh, because this happens usually when you are new in, in some, some place, some company, and everything is already built and you're just going and you have tickets now and you have to figure out what is doing this uh, because I have to add a new step, but I, I need to figure out what is doing first. So it depends on how you approach to things or how do you learn actually. Uh, but if I can share my experience, uh, the best that works for me is uh, read the pipeline, try to understand what is doing just uh, writing the code, just reading the code, sorry. Uh, maybe look or grab for previous builds and see why what they are actually doing and try to track uh, what is happening in that build. Uh, and yeah, maybe that can help you to figure out what is going on in that pipeline. And in that way, you can now add and customize new stuff for that. So yeah, it depends on, on how you approach uh, things, but you, you will figure it out. You just have to uh, take, uh, put your hands on the product and understand it. I yeah. understand what you're saying. Thank you. That's good advice. No problem. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think um, we are almost at the end of the session. Alison, would you like to close up? Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Andre. We have way more questions than we could get to, but you know, if you've um, enjoyed uh, the Ling Coffee this time, we, we can definitely um, uh, do this again at the meetup uh, next month or the or the one of the meetups in the future. So um, thanks everyone for your input, but special thanks to to Brendan O'Leary um, and Addie Wolf as well, uh, and the team at uh, GitLab who um, pulled together the, the presentation on Brendan's presentation and also the swag for this evening. We really appreciate it, Brendan. And um, uh, I can tell by the, the questions that were asked and, and the way people interacted that they really enjoyed your presentation. So thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you again, Brendan and, and everyone who contributed to the discussion. Um, it, it, we, we did the Lean Coffee first time, so uh, please, if you have any comments, suggestions, please send us uh, over a meetup uh, a message or, or, or email. And as always, we are looking for speakers. We are looking, it's a great opportunity for to share your experience um, and, and you know, show yourself and, and your organization. So uh, please contact us if you would like to uh, uh, speak and we'll see you next month. See you next month. Thank you. Thank you, Andre, Allison, and everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Bye.